I did want to invite you to take a Bible if you have one handy with you. And we'll turn to the Old Testament to start off in our study of the Word of God this morning in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter number 12. Uh, so it might seem like a very strange place to uh, start an Easter message in Exodus. <laughs> We're going right to the second book of the Bible, and it's very near the beginning, but yet at the same time, uh, there's so much in the Bible that really does connect. Uh, it's the kind of book that you can study your whole life and keep finding rich truths. Right. You know, the first day you pick up your Bible, you'll find something good. Right. And after the, you know, eight millionth time you pick up your Bible, you know, it's still so good and so rich. And I'm thankful for it. I trusted Christ as my Savior more than 30 years ago. And, and just every day, it's just so full of truth. It's life-changing and helpful and powerful for each of our lives. So we're going to look at a little bit of the story. Now, obviously, we know, I think, already that, that when we talk about Easter, we're talking about the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection on that Sunday morning, uh, a little over 2,000 years ago. And so, or, well, a little less than 2,000 years ago, but um, he, he rose again after three days in the grave. And so we're going we're gonna to understand at the beginning that, okay, we're, we're talking about Jesus' death and his resurrection. But sometimes the story is so much better when you understand the prequel, you know, what happened to lead up to that? What brought us to this point? Maybe you've read a book or seen a film and you thought, boy, that was fantastic. And then, then the prequel came out, right? And you're like, oh, this is going to be even better now. And that's sort of what we're going to do this morning. We're going we're to come to the rest of the story later. But I wanted to start with a little bit of the background and history that leads up to that amazing moment in time when Christ did rise from the dead. So we're going to start off by looking at a few verses here. If you found it in Exodus 12, you can follow along and I'll start reading from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him, uh, unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the sheep, out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts and upon the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the perkins thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. <coughs> And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Mm. All right. I told you I was going to read 10 verses, but I got carried away in verse 11. Amen. It's just so good. <laughs> you know. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we get into our Bible study this morning. Mm. Father, we are so richly blessed to be able to have the Bible and to have it in our language and to be able to open the Word of God together and to hear from you this morning uh, the story of what happened so many years ago and how it connects to our lives today. I pray that you would help me this morning to speak clearly and, and <coughs> capably that our lives would be helped by our time spent together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at some Passover pictures because really what we're talking about here in the book of Exodus is the Passover. And uh, the nation of Israel had been living in Egypt. And the Egyptians had, had enslaved them and forced them into bondage and hard service. And God was telling the nation of Israel, he said, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to set you free from this bondage and this captivity. And Moses was the man that God used to bring them out of Egypt. Now, this goes way back in history. We're talking 3,500 years ago. This is, a, this is way back. Um, they didn't have Google. You know, they didn't have cell phones. Um, some of us remember that better than others. Um, this is a long time ago. Before any of us were even... Um, even imagined to be believed to be existing right so we're gonna look at some of the pictures that happened in this passover celebration because god was giving them not just a feast to commemorate leaving egypt but a foreshadowing of what was to come a picture that would help them understand something that was going to happen later so we're going to look at this and see what god was going to teach them there's there's four things i wanted to look at sorry five things i want to look at this morning in these passover pictures the first thing is death because um death was coming uh, inexorably. 
this was a very serious night because the, God had told them that, that he was going to pass through the land of Egypt and that the, among the Egyptians, the firstborn in every home would die. And this was how God was getting the attention of the Egyptians to say, you're doing wrong and you need to let my people go. And so there was a, a death that was coming. There was no dodging it. There was no avoiding it. It was coming. Now, it's coming to all of us too, isn't it? You know, we can all live our lives pretending and ignoring and living like it's not coming. But the truth is, we all have that in our future. I saw a video online recently. It was talking about um, uh, funeral expenses and those sorts of things. And they said, well, the human mortality rate is stuck at 100% so far. So you know, uh, these sorts of things are, are in the future for everyone. But as we look at the scriptures, we understand that 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 inexorable meeting we have with God one day is very scary to some people. And that's understandable. In, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says that, that Christ came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He says the people that Christ came to save were people that, that all their lifetime they were in bondage to this fear of death. Yeah. And a lot of people live their whole life terrified of what could happen in their future. And God came to, to set us free from that fear. God came to give us deliverance and victory over that fear. There was a certain uh, unfamiliarity and uncertainty in the lives of these people that God was speaking to here, to here in Exodus chapter 12. There was a lot of uncertainty of what was going to happen. Because they knew that these things had been told by the Lord, that this was going to happen that night in Egypt. And uh, this had never happened before. This wasn't something they had experienced regularly in the past. This was very unusual. And it was also something that, that they were not entirely certain of what was going to take place. And it's helpful, I think, for us to imagine their feelings on a night like that, wondering what was going to happen in their home that night, what was going to happen in their neighbor's home la that night, wondering who was going to be there in the morning and who wasn't. And so there's that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, our departure from this life happens suddenly and unexpectedly. And that sometimes makes it much more difficult for those who remain, but many people have made no preparations for that. And I'm not just talking about funeral expenses, okay? Uh, I'm talking about being ready spiritually to stand before our Creator and to acknowledge our relationship to Him. Uh, I, that video I was talking about, they said in that video that something like two-thirds of people uh, have no written will. They, they, they haven't written a will because they're, I think, I think a lot of us are just like, oh, it's so far off, or we're like, I don't want to think about it, <laughs> you know? But a lot of people have not even made those simple preparations for the inevitable. How much more important it is than, than writing a will, it is to be spiritually ready. And so these people needed some help because there was some uh, certain death coming. But in verses 3 to 10 of our text, we see also a lamb. Uh, now, my family and I, we were visiting my brother's family just last night. And um, they live on a farm. And guess what they've got right now? Lambs. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, I have it on good authority that they're they're desperately cute. Um, I uh, I didn't go out to the, look at the lambs. I stayed indoors, and you know what? I probably should not look at the lambs because <laughs> lambs are cute, right? Um, so they they were told on the tenth day of, the, of this first month of the year. Now it was the springtime of the year, just like we're experiencing right now. That's why we celebrate this time of year because the Passover was in the springtime of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, incidentally, the reason why Easter changes date every year is because it's linked to the Jewish calendar, which is different than ours. And it's confusing. I wish they would I wish we could just have Easter on the same the calendar day or the same weekend every year. It'd be so much more convenient for calendar planning and scheduling. But but this is because it's tied to those that's Passover celebration. Yeah. Because Jesus Christ died at the Passover time. And so uh, this lamb, they would each family would get a lamb and they would keep it with them in the home uh, from the 10th day of the month until the 14th day of the month. So for ten, uh, four days out of that first beginning of that first month of the year, uh, they would keep this lamb in the home. Part of the reason was, I believe, to be able to examine the lamb because they were told that when they brought a sacrifice to the Lord or they had something like that, um, in verse 5 it says the lamb should be without blemish. Having it in the house with you for four days, it'd be a very good chance for you to notice if there's anything wrong with it. You know, if it wasn't healthy or if it was defective or injured or something of that nature. Because it's not that God cared as much about the lamb as about what the lamb pictured. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because he wanted a perfect example of what was to come. And so that's why these Passover pictures are so important. Sometimes you see things in the Old Testament and you go, why in the world did that matter so much to the Lord? Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes it's not because that mattered as much as what it was to, to teach us and what it was to picture. Amen. And that's why the lamb had to be perfect, because the lamb had to picture somebody else, and that is Jesus. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. And we know that in the Old Testament, we read what was going to happen to that lamb. It was going to give its life to be a, a, um, a means whereby life could be saved. Yeah. And here, John the Baptist has said, Jesus is that lamb. He is the fulfillment of that picture in Exodus chapter 12, whereby we are able to see the, the reality come into fruition that Jesus Christ was that lamb who died as a substitute for our sins, who took our place and was able to bring redemption and salvation to the world. Um, just like that lamb in the Old Testament, uh, what it provided for the doorposts uh, was a means whereby these people could be saved. So also in a much greater way, uh, our lamb, Jesus Christ, provided his blood upon some wooden timbers as well to provide a means of access for our salvation and deliverance from our sin and our guilt. His blood makes us able to come to God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, But now in, Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. And so we who, because of our sins, we are separated from God. You yeah. know, all have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. There's nobody who can stand before Amen. God and say, I'm innocent. I've never done anything wrong. Um, uh, I've had people sometimes say to me, no, oh, I've, I've not done anything. <laughs> well, okay, uh, we'll mark down a lie for today. You know, yeah. um, If we're honest, we all know we're guilty before God. We, yeah. we might sometimes like to rank our level of guilt next to other people. But when you stand before the judge in the courtroom, it's not how guilty. It's guilty or innocent, right? Yeah. And that's how we stand before God. Are we innocent or are we guilty? Well, we're all guilty before God. Amen. And because of our guilt, we're separated from God. We have that barrier spiritually between us and the Lord. We can't enter into heaven. The Bible tells us heaven is a place where no sin can enter. Yeah. It's a perfect place. If I showed up with sin in my heart, it wouldn't be a perfect place anymore. Yeah. I could make a mess of it in a hurry by being... being my sinful self mm -hmm. and so the only way that anybody can have access to heaven is through the blood of christ through that salvation that came through jesus christ mm -hmm. the bible tells us neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved mm -hmm. and so that's why jesus christ came he was that that lamb that was pictured there in exodus who died in our place on the cross the the innocent dying for the guilty he was that perfect lamb he was that one who had never done wrong he was god in the flesh dying for us yeah. and bearing our debt upon himself it's as though i stood in the courtroom guilty i knew i was guilty the judge knew i was guilty all these spectators knew i was guilty i mean they had it on a videotape like it was irrefutable mm -hmm. i stand guilty the punishment is a fine and i can't afford it i can't pay it but jesus christ came in and said i will pay his fine yeah. for him now the fine for my sin the bible says the wages of sin is death yeah. And Jesus Christ died for you and for me so that by his substitution, our debt could be paid spiritually. And that's the glory of our celebration at Easter is that Jesus Christ made salvation available for us, yeah. that he died in our place. He took our role and he took our guilt upon himself so that we could have his righteousness put upon our account. Amen. And so that's the lamb that we see. Um, the blood was necessary. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Uh, the way that God brought salvation was through the blood of Christ. And his blood was necessary, not just his death, but his blood. You know what? Salvation doesn't come by a feeling. Mm -hmm. Salvation doesn't come by saying words in a prayer. It doesn't come from a tradition. It doesn't come from our family ancestry. It doesn't come from baptism. It doesn't come from a religion. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ Amen. and him alone. Yeah. And that's the Bible message. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Yeah. And so we are able by God's word to find the truth that, that this lamb pictures that means of salvation. That as he, he gave his life to save the people of that household, so also that all who have come to Christ today can be saved by his giving of his life for us. That yeah. sinless sacrifice for sins forever. That's why we sang that song this morning, once for all. Uh, you know, we don't have to come back over and over and over again to make sacrifice for sin. Right. Jesus did it, he settled it once for all. And all who will come to God by Christ have it settled once and for all. You know what, as a, as a Christian, I trusted Christ as my savior more than 30 years ago, and I don't need to get saved every day. 
You know, it was once for all, as the scripture says in Hebrews. And so that's what we see in this lamb. You know what? This lamb was that picture of the Christ who would come. In Hebrews 10 and verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. All right, the third thing I wanted to notice here in the in our Passover pictures is the Passover. The fact that there was a passing over. We didn't read it yet, but in verse number 13, turn the page here, verse 13, it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And so that's why the, the blood was the, the passing over of their, uh, of their family and their home. And so also when God sees the blood of Christ that has been applied to my life by faith, his judgment passes right over me. He says, oh, I can skip that one. <laughs> they've been forgiven. They've been cleansed. They've been given new life. They've been born again. I can pass over them when it comes time for judgment for sin because it's been washed away. It's been yeah. covered over by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And the truth of the Passover and of the Easter celebration is that God can then pass over. He can, he can legally dismiss my case because it's been paid in full. The guilt has been cleansed. And that blood, when it was applied to their home, God was able to pass over them. And unless the blood of Jesus Christ has spiritually, not physically obviously, but spiritually been applied to your life like it was to mine so many years ago, then the judgment cannot pass over. And we must all stand and account for our sins unless the blood is applied to our lives through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of us has to come to the point in our own life, nobody can do it for us. We have to ourselves come to a place of decision and say, you know what, I'm going to acknowledge I'm guilty before God. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm a sinner and I deserve judgment. But by faith, I'm going to trust Jesus Christ's payment for me, and I'm going to call on the Lord to apply his payment to my life and, and my salvation. And so when we repent, we come to God as a guilty sinner, not as somebody who's like, well, you know, I, you know, yeah, I did some bad things, but it's not my fault. You know, <laughs> that doesn't work very well in court. Right? Yeah, I committed the crime, but it's not my fault. Yeah, try that sometime. It won't work for you. Trust me. I'm sure of it. Um, when we come to God and say, yes, it's my fault. I was wrong. I have broken your laws. I deserve judgment. But Jesus offered payment for me. And I accept his payment. I put my trust in him. And I call on God to save me. And that's what happened when they made that application of the blood. They were saying, yes, we need it. We need God to save us. If they, if they said, oh, we don't need it. Well, then they wouldn't have that, that passing over. They had to acknowledge their need. They have to do what they were told to do in faith. And say, yeah, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know why this is going to work. But God says, this is what I need to do. And respond by faith in obedience to God. And because of that, they were able to be saved. Knowing about the lamb didn't bring safety. Lots of people know about Jesus. But unless there's been a personal application of his salvation into your heart and life, it's not going to save you. You can know about a medicine, but if you don't take the medicine, it's not going to do you any good. And so oftentimes people know about church, they know about God, they know about the Bible. But the Bible says, you know, uh, in James chapter 2, it says, uh, you believe that there's one God. He says, do do us well. The devils also believe and tremble. You know, just believing God is real doesn't give you a relationship with him, right? Mm -hmm. I know the queen is real. I've been to I've been to London. I've seen her palace. You know, I've seen her on TV, but I don't know her. You know, yeah. there's a huge difference between knowing about God and actually having a relationship with Him through Christ. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about here. This made it possible for judgment to be passed over and a relationship to begin. Mm -hmm. The application of the blood made the difference. The fourth thing we're going to mention is life. Because of the Passover, these people had a new chance at life. Yeah. They were set free from that danger of death. They were set free from that fear that had kept them in bondage. They had a life that would continue beyond the day of death. Yeah. And as a Christian, God tells me that because I've trusted Christ as my Savior, when I die and leave this world physically, my soul and spirit will go to be with God. Yeah. And I will have life beyond this life. The Bible tells us about heaven, a place of peace and safety, a place of joy and fulfillment forevermore, where there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no crying, there'll be no sickness, there'll be no death, there'll be no sin. I mean, we won't need a police force up there. I mean, we'll just be able to enjoy harmony with God and with each other forever. It's hard for us even to imagine because our world is so messed up by sin. It's hard for us to imagine a place where everything's perfect. You know, nobody gets sick. Nobody ever has to say goodbye in death. 
nobody ever has to deal with fear <coughs> and danger and crime and injury. Place of perfection. And that's the life that God wants us to come to through Jesus Christ. I hope that as we look at this passage, I wanted you to notice in verse 14, he says, And this day, this Passover day, shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Jewish people, even today, you know, 3,500 years later, they still, in the springtime, they have a Passover remembrance. And, uh, and so this past Friday night, if you knew any Jewish people, they were probably having a Passover Seder on Friday night to remember the Passover. Many, many years later, thousands of years later, they're still remembering that. But I think it's interesting that when we're talking about the life that they had, you know, they were in a place where they were facing death. And then all of a sudden, through the application of that blood, all of a sudden they're able to talk about forever. <laughs> in the, the last verse there, or the last word there in verse number 14, the last two words, forever. He says, you all of a sudden have a forever to talk about because of what happened on that Passover night. Mm -hmm. Do you have a forever future with God? Yeah. I hope that each of us do. All right, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about resurrection because that's what Easter is all about. If you have a Bible, I'd like to turn now to the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 28. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at the, the sort of the last chapter of what we're going to talk about this morning as far as the story of the resurrection and our Savior. Because Jesus Christ, yes, he died on that cross for our sins, but lots of people have died. Yeah. On the physical level, it didn't look like anything different than just people dying. But Jesus Christ was not just a man. He was God in human flesh. And he came and did something that nobody else could ever do. All right, Matthew 28, let's start with verse 1. It says, In the end of the Sabbath, that's the Saturday, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, so I celebrate on Sunday morning, right? Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. They came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Remember, there were some guards left there to guard the tomb to make sure nobody stole the body. <laughs> Guess what? An angel showed up and they were terrified. And it says they became as dead men. I don't know if they passed out or if they were just faking, you know. <laughs> Leave me alone, I'm dead. <laughs> Playing possum, you know what I'm talking about? Um, and the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy mm -hmm. and did run to bring his disciples' word. Mm -hmm. Jesus proved that life after death was possible. How? By having it. Yeah. He rose from the grave and proved that he did have power over death. He did have power over the grave. That's why we sang this morning the song that references scripture, Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You know, yeah. there's no victory in the grave when Jesus triumphs over that death yeah. and grave. Yeah. And so he proved that resurrection life was powerful through him. In Revelation 1 and verse 18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. There's no, no lock that's going to keep him from life. Amen. He says, I've got the keys. You can't lock me in with death. You can't send me to hell. I am the one who has power over all of it. Keys are about authority, right? Yeah. Uh, in uh, a lot of situations of life, uh, businesses or those sorts of things, who has the keys? The boss, <laughs> the person in authority, right? Uh, you don't give the new guy who just started yesterday the keys to everything. <laughs> you know, the people who are at authority get the keys. And that's what Jesus is. He's the one with authority over death. And he can open and he can shut. Keys are good for unlocking and they're good for locking. He has the authority over death and hell. He defeated death by his own power. In John 10 and verse 17 and 18, before he died, he said, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. 
And so Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to go and lay down my life. Not because somebody's forcing me to it, but because as a love gift, I am giving my life for the men and women and boys and girls of this world. Amen. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen. There's no greater love than what Jesus did for us when he died and rose again for us. And he did it willingly. He did it of his own power. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't have somebody else drag him out of that tomb. He said, I will take my life up again. In John 2, verses 19 and 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And that confused them because they were at the temple. <laughs> but the next, in verse 21 there says, But he spake of the temple of his body. Yeah. He was using a metaphor to say, this temple, he says, you can destroy it if you want to, but in three days I'll raise it back up again. Amen. And he didn't say somebody else was going to raise his body back up again. Mm -hmm. He says, I will raise it up again. Yeah. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was able to prove by his own ability mm -hmm. the victory over death. And that's why as a Christian, I don't have to be scared of death. Because I serve a risen Savior. I serve a Savior who stomped on death and, and had no fear of it. He had victory over death. And so as a Christian, because I've trusted Christ as my Savior, you know, when I was a small boy, my brother told me about Jesus' death for me, and I put my faith and trust in Christ, acknowledged my guilt, and trusted Christ as Savior for myself. And God has given me a new life where I can walk with God, I can know the Lord, I can have that home in heaven, I can see transformation in my life because of what God has done, and that's available to everybody who will come to God by faith. No one else could raise themselves from the dead. Yeah. Lots of people would love to have tried, right. but it doesn't work like that. Only God has that power. All those who will trust in Christ and put their faith in Him for salvation will also live beyond the grave. There is life, there is eternal salvation. Why is it that every culture in human history has some sort of, of spiritual awareness that there is something more than just this life? Why is it that all throughout human history, people have believed, yes, there is an eternity? It's because God designed us and created us with that awareness that, yes, there's a spiritual reality in this world. It's not just what you can see and feel. It's not just what you can experience with your physical self. But there's a spiritual reality that there is God. There is heaven. There is hell. There is a spiritual layer to life that we can't see with our eyes. And that's the truth of the scripture, that when we put our trust in him, he gives us access to a new life in Christ, to salvation, eternal life, and home in heaven for eternity. Mm -hmm. And that is only available to those who will respond and say, yes, I am guilty, but I will trust Christ in his payment for me. Jesus is the only way. In Romans 10 and verse 13, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. You know what? God's not going to turn anybody down if they come to him by faith. And the richness of the gospel is it's available for everybody. It's not for one religious group. It's not for one social group. It's not one ethnic group. It's not one country. It's not one point in history. It's for all the world. Yeah. And for each person here this morning, we all have to have that point in our life where we make that decision to say, yes, I will acknowledge my guilt before God. I will trust him as my Savior. Mm -hmm. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you for the opportunity again to speak about Christ and his resurrection. One of the most joyous truths in the Bible is to remember that Jesus lives. He is not here, for he is risen. And we thank you that you are giving us the truth of scripture, the dependable truth of your word, to give us the confidence that there is life for your children after death. That we need not fear that day of departure because it is a day when we enter into something even so much richer. Lord, we pray for each this morning that we would each have made that decision in our heart and life to have called upon the name of the Lord. And if there's any here this morning who have not yet done that, that today would be the day. Maybe other people think they have, maybe they've told other people they have. Maybe they're living a life that looks good on the outside. Lord, I pray that each of us today would be in that relationship with Christ through the salvation he came to give. Um, thank you for the pictures of the Passover and how they show us our Savior. In Jesus' name we ask your help. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books as we get ready to close the service and turn lastly to number 243. Hymn number 243. We'll sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Mm -hmm. 243. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Number 243.
I, I always come up and ask too as well. She's got the biggest smile on her face. Oh, there's my son. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you for the uh, 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 and Oh, 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 oh,